Today is November 11th, 2020, and I am Stacy Krim, interviewing with David Gwynn for the Pride of the Community Project. Would you please state your name as you would like it to appear for the interview as well as your pronouns? Um, I go by uh, he, him pronouns, and um, my name is Matthew McCarthy. All right, and where did you come from originally? Um, so I was actually born in Baltimore, Maryland, um, both my mother and father, um, were born and raised there. Um, and my father worked in IT for hospitals. And by the time I was six, um, his job actually transferred to Raleigh. Um, so we moved here, um, just outside of the Raleigh area of Johnston County. It's called uh, the little town called Clayton. It's not so little anymore. It's become a sleeper community for the Raleigh area. Um, but we moved there and shortly after, within six months, my dad's job moved, moved elsewhere and he just, he didn't wanna move. Um, so my parents still currently live in the same house and they've been there uh, 21 years now, so. So you grew up in Clayton? Mm -hmm, yep, I can actually officially say I'm a North Carolinian. <laughs> <laughs> I spent the majority of my life here. And what was the climate like for the LGBTQ community there? Um, not the best. Um, I, it definitely um, prolonged my being comfortable coming out. Um, I didn't come out to friends with friends until like I was 19 and then my parents until I was 21 when the conversation was brought up by my mother um, and it wasn't the best conversation. Um, it, a few things were said that kind of hurt, but we're still very close today. Um, but she was the only one really in the family that it was a little difficult in the beginning. And my father was fine with it. He was very accepting, so. Did you have any support from friends or family as you were coming out? Um, yes, I had a really close friend group that I made um, shortly after high school. One of them um, was someone that I ended up uh, befriending in high school and then got closer after we graduated. Um, because to be quite honest, when I was in high school, I didn't speak to many people, especially after my freshman year, because um, I suffered uh, uh, basically it was cyberbullying. It was in the era before Facebook. Um, it was used through um, MySpace. Um, I don't know if you would like me to include that in like a separate question or like when you ask another question or I can go into detail about it now. Um, you can go into detail about it and just talk about what you're comfortable with. Okay. Um, so I was 14 as a freshman and uh, two supposed friends uh, copied the image that I had on my MySpace profile and made a separate one that had very, uh, I guess, gay-centric content um, and uh, took it upon themselves to solicit certain uh, guys in the freshman class um, under my profile. And it was, to be quite honest, it was devastating. Like it devastated me, um, especially when you're going through your whole, everyone says in high school, you know, you try, you're still trying to carve out like really your identity. And with that, it kind of just, it regressed my identity. Um, and with between sophomore, junior and senior year, I hardly spoke to anyone. Um, and <laughs> grew my hair out long and dressed all in black. And it basically just kept my head, head down at, at that point. So um, yeah, it, it wasn't fun, but it also was a learning experience for me too, because I, since I was the victim of it, um, it also helps you appreciate things more when you become an adult. Um, and also being comfortable in your own body because it took me a long time after that to 
begin to be comfortable in my body and be comfortable being gay. And I hate, I hate saying that, but it, it, when you go through something like that, I feel like it does, it can rip your identity away. Were you um, able to uh, find any gay friends or anyone who would support you during that time? Um, not specifically during that time. Um, I actually, short, uh, after high school, I finally opened up to my mother about what had happened after coming out to her. And she, she told me she had no idea. She didn't. So that's a portion of my life. It's very hard for me to rem remember. Um, because I was so much deep in thought, um, and just in my own head uh but apparently i must have hit it well to where i just kind of went through it on my own i was actually dating a female when it also occurred and they she started apparently to get tired of hearing about it for me but um she listened a little bit about it but other than that, um, I, I really didn't have a whole lot of a support group, maybe like one or two friends here and there throughout my whole um, four years. But other than that, it, it wasn't many. So after you graduated high school, were you able to find a circle of friends? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, by the time I was 19, um, I found a good group of friends. Um, who really helped me come out of my shell um, and be comfortable being gay. And this would have been probably around the time of 2012, 2013, um, that I really got close with this group. And um, also too, it's funny in the, in the grand scheme of things politically, um, there was also starting to become a transition during that time too of you know accepting of um the queer community um unfortunately at that point you know it was only mostly accepting of gay and lesbian and then we transcended into the opening more of like nine but non-binary and uh trans so did you hang out at any bars or clubs specifically for the LGBTQ population? Um, I did. Uh, there is a bar in Raleigh called Legends. Um, it's very familiar, I'm sure, um, across the state. Um, and I hung out there. I started going there when I was probably around 19 or 20. Um, just to see what it was like. I was always interested in like meeting someone to, um, at that point in time, that didn't really happen. Um, so I would just kind of go and mingle, um, but I was always like uh, a wallflower. I was in the corners. Um, I was a cigarette smoker. Um, and so I would usually just be out and like, they have a middle patio area. Of course, it's changed a little bit now from the last time I've been there. Um, but I would just usually sit on a bench and just chain smoke. And while you were, uh, after you graduated and you were still in the Raleigh area, did you attend another school or were you just enjoying post high school life? So I did two years of community college um, at the um, Johnston County Community College uh, and then transferred to NC State um, I did take a six month little reprieve from school. Um, and so I started at NC State, probably be uh, fall of 2014. Yeah, it would be 2014. Um, and uh, I was pursuing my uh, BA in history. Um, and it was, it was an interesting school. I didn't really excel there the best, um, but I, I enjoyed my experience there. 
Um, did you get a feel for the LGBTQ climate on the NC State? Unfortunately not. Um, when I got accepted, I had my own um, place. And uh, when I got accepted, I was still continuing to work full time and also taking classes full time. So the workload and my grades sort of slipped and my parents asked if I wanted to move back home. Um, and just commute to school. So I was a commuter. So I really didn't get the full experience that I really wanted. Um, I didn't have dorm, any dorm life um, or just making really friends on campus. Um, I was very separate from it. I just uh, came, you know, uh, sat in the classes and then got walked back to my car and went home. So that was pretty much the uh, extent to what I'd um, contributed to things on campus. At what point did you really feel comfortable enough to have meaningful relationships? Um, I was 21 and um, I met someone. It was, I'm trying to think what year that would have been, 2015, um, met someone and that I lost my virginity to this person. Um, a little later in life, I was again, 21. And um, unfortunately, it, the relationship didn't really work well for me. Um, it had a very negative effect on my overall um, mood. Uh, my depression really set in again. Um, and so I spiraled. We only dated for about three months. And um, I, I don't understand why I, it became like the relationship turned so bad for me. I think at that point in my life, I finally needed to go on some sort of antidepressant. And I hadn't because I, I really had been deeply depressed with a few ups here and there um, since high school and had not been medicated for it at all. Um, so this had a, a triggering effect for that. Um, and after we broke up, um, I started to try to take an antidepressant that caused me to spiral even worse. Um, I was chain smoking constantly. Like I was smoking at least a pack a day. Um, wasn't eating, just, very anxious, but also exacerbating my anxiety by drinking coffee or uh, soda all day. Um, and unfortunately was, had a um, nervous breakdown um, in late June of 2015 and was taken to the ER and was unfortunately involuntarily committed. Um, I was in the ER for three days, um, suicide watch, because unfortunately I was in such a um, exacerbated state when uh, they had me in the triage, I was talking about how deeply depressed I was and um, how I'd been thinking about suicide. And they said, unfortunately, we can't release you um, so I was placed in a room in the ER. I couldn't have TV or anything. Um, and they held me there until a bed opened at a place that they could find in the state. And unfortunately, the only place in the state that they could find a bed was in Lumberton, which is very close to the South Carolina border. And I had to be transferred in a, um, cop car uh luckily they could sit me in the front seat but um I still had to be handcuffed and from um Clayton that's still at least an hour drive um so they took me there and when I was taken into the triage area I unfortunately found out that I <laughs> couldn't be released for another 72 hours um so I spent the next three days in there and um, I look at it as a really positive experience in my life because 
it finally got me on the track to um, get my depression and anxiety under control. So. Were you able to um, uh, visit anyone, any mental health care professional that um, could speak to you and understand LGBTQ issues and some of the things you were going through? Um, I'm trying to think. I don't think anyone really focused on my um, sexual orientation. I did see a therapist for a while um, after that because I was required to in order and in, um, in accordance with my release. I had to have appointments scheduled. And um, they talked about my, I guess, issues with that. Um, and we worked through them. I think it was mostly working through getting over that relationship because uh, it was my first real relationship. And I had deep feelings for them. So just going through that, um, I didn't see the therapist for very long, unfortunately, um, because I had reached a point that my I felt like my medication was working. So I just went about my daily life. Um, but yeah, as far as like being uh, accepting with the issues, they made it a very comfortable experience for me um, to actually, you know, feel relaxed. Um, and I'm trying to think as far as like, at that point, I'm, I think I was fine with being gay. I, since I had a, had that first relationship, I felt like it opened the door for me that, you know, this is a real, you know, thing where you can have relationships, you can carve out relationships despite living in a rural county of North Carolina, so. So, You've been through a lot of trauma. Um, how do you collect yourself and re-enter into relationships? Um, how did you, you know, after such a bad breakup, how did you uh, start dating again? So dating was a little scarce for many years. Um, I did not have my second committed relationship until 2018. And that was in 2015 that that first relationship was. So it was quite a few years of just um, me not being smart and being just sexually active. Um, in that period, I had probably, it's, I've heard very high numbers from obviously other people, but mine is not high. It's like around eight or nine people. Um, most, you know, just were sexual experiences and get up the next day and you go to work kind of thing. Um, I had a few that were a little longer lasting, um, some that ran for probably about a year um, on top of other um like uh, sexual relationships too. Um, so I was at times seeing three people at the same time for a period, um, so. So you're growing up um, and having relationships in the post HIV AIDS world. Um, how did that influence you? So I did have um, a, a over year, over one year relationship with someone that was um, HIV positive, but they were on medication. So um, it was not transmittable at that point, but I met them through an app um, and they were very open and forthcoming with it on their profile on the app. And there was physical attributes that very much attracted me to them. Um, and we started to see each other, um, sometimes not often, 
um, it may be here and there over a few months, but we did not use any form of protection. And at that point in my life, I, I was comfortable with seeing this person because I knew that they were on medication. And I don't know, I guess liking them, I mean, besides physical, the physical attributes, but knowing that, you know, you can still be sexually active with someone. Although there's always that fear too, that you could still, because you're not using protection. Because unfortunately I never use protection hardly. I've only had like one or two experiences where we did use protection. And it's very embarrassing to say that, but uh, it, it, the moment catches up with me a little too quickly and then I just kind of give in. Um, so, there was always that fear and I was tested um, after we uh, quit seeing each other. Um, and a few times while I believe we were still continuing to see each other, I, I was getting tested, so. So just to kind of um, an unsubtle changing of topics, but uh, <laughs> this would be my next question. At what point did you come to Greensboro? So I actually came to Greensboro in, it would be 2019. Uh, we moved here August of 2019. Uh, so I could attend graduate school at uh, UNC Greensboro. And were you aware of Greensboro uh, UNCG's reputation as being a gay friendly school? Unfortunately, I was not. I wish I had done my research a little bit more. And I, I mean, it's so welcoming. Uh, that uh, there's a lot I've seen a lot of uh, trans people on campus too and I think it's wonderful that it's so inclusive um, because when I went to NC State I just I didn't notice that inclusivity um, when I was there although it was you know several years ago and things have progressed at a huge rate uh, over the last few years but um, yeah the, I think that's what it, really makes me love the school so much is that they're so inclusive. Mm -hmm. And what's the, you haven't been here very long, but what's the difference in social life in Greensboro versus Raleigh? Um, I, we decided a few times, my partner and I to go to chemistry just to see how the, the scene was. Um, and we found it, uh, welcoming. We did go kind of early to chemistry and I'm sure everyone knows what the experience with the gay bar. If you go at 10 o'clock, it's going to be dead, very dead. Um, and it doesn't really pick up until like 12, 1230. Um, so we just came and mingled and had a few drinks and the bartender was really nice. And I, I enjoyed it because I found that when you go to Legends, Legends is just such a, I don't want to speak ill will. Uh, it reminds me of like, it's, I don't know how I want to say it. It's like an amusement park in a sense. It's like, there's just so many people and I just feel like it's, uh, it can be clickish there too. Um, and I quit going. I only went the first few years until I was probably about 23 and maybe went back once or twice after that um, and just quit going because it just wasn't something I enjoyed when I went anymore. Um, but I did like going to chemistry um, and we did go back later in October of 2019 there. Um, my partner and I for Halloween decided we were gonna be um, two of the women from Designing Women. So I was Annie Potts character, Mary Jo. And uh, my partner was uh, Suzanne Sugarbaker. So uh, we had a good time. It was a lot of fun. Um, and that's the last time we've been there since uh, everything because once February and March rolled around, um, threatening of lockdown and things like that occurred. So, 
Have you ever been a part of the drag scene in North Carolina? Not me um, specifically, my partner is. Um, they've performed in Alamance Pride since, um, I think this year they did it virtually and that was the, I think seventh or eighth time that they've been in it. And uh, so over the relationship that we've had, I've been um, just like a helper behind the scenes um, over the last few years at any shows that they're at. So like Alamance Pride, they've done a few other um, drag bingos in Durham, which are always a lot of fun. Um, so that's really, the last few years is really when I've become involved in it. What was Alamance Pride like? It's fun, it's a great experience. Um, even the virtual experience that we had um, was wonderful um, because we they could reach a wider audience and they had a good um, lineup of performers. And my partner do, loves to do obscure um, performances. So there is a song by, I believe, Bob the Drag Queen calls, called Purse First. And they did a performance and basically started with a big purse and inside of each purse is a smaller purse and just keep doing a reveal of their purses until it's a little Barbie purse. Um, so everyone seems to love that performance. And it was my first time seeing them do it because um, I think this is the second or third time that they performed that. Um, and everyone's just really friendly and welcoming. We all laugh, we have a good time. Um, and last year when it was able to be done um, with large gatherings, um, it was outside and they had several vendors, um, different things like that. And people come, I believe from all over the state, uh, just to come and see people that they maybe have not seen since the last Pride, so. Can you talk a bit about the difference in socializing and having these events pre-COVID and during COVID? Because you're the first person we've interviewed who's who's going through it. <laughs> through right. Um, so pre-COVID, it was it was nice to have it outside, um, and it's in October, so it's usually well, sometimes it's t temperate weather. Uh, sometimes it could be 90 degrees, but the, the time that I did go last year, it was very comfortable. And um, now post, I think the one that I witnessed this October, there was more hope with it. Um, and also too, I just like the family aspect of it. Um, I feel like they were just so much more focused on the family aspect and like just having hope because at that point things have had just gotten so crazy and the election was coming up. Um, so. So I'm gonna ask you a question that you can answer or choose to not, but okay. how has the state of politics really um, influenced you and your comfort level in North Carolina? So comfort level, um, I still, I think a lot of people still fear, not so much fear, but just don't feel comfortable enough walking down the street holding the hand of their partner. Um, I witnessed it here more in Greensboro than I would have if I had still continued to live in Raleigh. Um, now, I feel more comfortable definitely with my partner because they've, helped me become comfortable with non-binary people and trans people um, because unfortunately being from Clayton and only having moved out of Clayton 
um, over the last year and a half, um, I didn't really get to experience um, meeting someone who's non-binary or um, a trans woman or a trans man. Um, it's just, I had to still hear from people, oh, I didn't realize you were gay. Um, or, oh, wow, you know, you've opened my eyes to gay men. And so I got used to that aspect. And so I, that's one of the reasons why I love my partner so much is that they've really opened my eyes to such a greater community. So um, there's a lot of people who are, uh, young people especially, who are potentially going through some of what you have been through. Oh, do you have any advice you could give them or any words of wisdom you could give them? So I, I know it seems hard in the beginning and you feel like you're alone um, and that you really can't open up to anyone, but please, please, please talk to someone because you, if you don't, it will turn into something far worse. Um, so just addressing your mental health. That's why I'm a huge advocate for mental health um, because you, you deserve to live a life <clears throat> free of depression and anxiety, or at least something where you're in check. Um, so just, and there's, there's people out there you can reach out to. And I know it, it seems like you can't uh, in the beginning, but just, just take the steps. And I even offer, you know, my personal help. So. Have you been approached by anyone younger to be kind of a mentor to? Um, not anyone, unfortunately. Um, I would love to be in the long run. <laughs> so, um, one question, sort of following up on the earlier one that I wanted to jump in on, as you're actually one of the younger people we've interviewed as part of this, and came out in in more of an online era. Could you talk maybe a little bit about how online resources were either important to you or maybe not important to you? I think um, once we reached the era of Facebook and Instagram, um, there really was seeing more or following more accounts that were more uh, queer centric. Um, and also I love uh, queer history. So um, they have a few accounts that I follow um, that each day they post sp sp specifically what happened on that day. It's like LGBTQ history. Um, so it's just nice to see things like that. And it's just more readily available at our fingertips at this point. And I think it makes some people feel less alone um, and that we can also uh, interact across borders and things like that. So you um, are at the history, you're doing your master's in history here, and you're going to be curating an LGBTQ history exhibit at the Greensboro History Museum uh, next year in 2021. Yay. Do you see yourself uh, continuing in LGBTQ history? Is that your hope in the future for your, your focus? Yes. And assisting in any way uh being an advocate for again mental health um and just interacting with the community and trying to help people that feel like they don't have the help um i've always wanted to give back to the community and i feel like a personal issues and going down the wrong path in the my earlier years just distracted me from it but um now that i'm on to achieve my master's next May. Um, I want to continue the work that will go into this exhibit to hopefully open doors um, to me be able to just maybe include a career in LGBTQ history.
Is there anything you'd like to talk about that we haven't covered in the interview so far? Um, I think the only thing I would talk about too is I talked a lot about mental health, but also in our community, there's a huge issue with drug abuse. Um, and I've been down that path. Uh, I've abused recreational drugs um, for several years and just really getting the help you need um, and reaching out to people and being honest with yourself about the addiction um, because you don't want to you don't want to wait too long because it can turn into something where unfortunately the only way out is your death um, but to go a little bit more into it and I'm a huge another advocate for um, helping with drug abuse because um, I've been open kind of with my cohort um, with my cocaine addiction and I feel bad talking about it in a professional setting um, but also too I am very proud of myself because I curbed the habit on my own um, I didn't receive professional help to curb it which I'm not saying anyone should do that. Like it's recommended you should receive professional help. Um, but just knowing that, you know, you can turn your life around. Um, it's not the be all end all. All right. Thank you for this very frank discussion. You covered a lot of points that I think many people can relate to and it's really an inspiring story. Thank um, you. I hope we'll be able to do an interview with you a few years from now where you can tell us how you progressed and that you're working in the, the history field. Yes, I, I'm glad that I, I didn't realize that my life was that interesting, I guess until you talk about it. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you. All right.